I want to touch briefly on the, you know, we, we often like to talk about trends within the movement and, and sort of what the conversation is in the libertarian world, because a lot of our listeners are in, engaged in that. And I don't think that this is just a conversation that's happening in our world, um, but it is the role of Kyle Rittenhouse in the, the uh, riots in Kenosha, Wisconsin. If you, if you're, Living under a rock and you don't know what happened, um, there was uh, – I'm blanking on Blake's first name. Is there a space in this rock if we could move in? No. Oh, sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, wh what is Blake's first name? I've, I've, is it Eric? Uh, the, the man who was shot seven times in the back by the cop. Jacob Blake. Jacob Blake. Thank you. Um so Jacob Blake was there's conflicting reports. He was either breaking up a fight between two women or he was there and had a um, basically he it was an ex and he was not supposed to be there. And uh, he was the police were called on him. Not sure what which is the truth. I think, um, I think both are the truth, to be honest with you. So I think okay. he was breaking up a fight, but his ex, one of the people in the fight was an ex that didn't want him there. So she called the police. And the the police arrived, and within the time they got the call from dispatch, the time he was shot was about three minutes, right? So mm -hmm. that's not a long time. Um, so they were told that he had a warrant. Um, he was there not doing anything wrong in his mind, but, you know, they uh, they tried to apprehend him. He said he didn't want nothing to do with that, so he started to walk away. And they, you know, they decided that he was a threat, so... Um, hold on. Is the sound supposedly and they, sound problems? Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And they also, uh, there's been conflicting reports. People trying to say that he had a gun, which he did not have. They said, trying to say he had a knife and there's no evidence that he had one on his person. They did say they found one in the floorboard of the, of the vehicle. Um, but there's no evidence that they knew that or, or anything. So it, it is hard to tell because the video is hard to understand some of the words. So, the the reports are that people are saying that he they were saying he has you know dropped the knife dropped the knife but you can't tell that for sure from the audio it's kind of hard to make out and no witnesses who are there say he had a knife on him at the time yeah all of these incidents fall under the rubric of this is an incredibly large complex society and there are a lot of things that go into an incident like this that are very difficult to ascertain in the middle of a passion. I've learned my lesson after the Covington kids. Like after the Covington kids, I came out and made moral pronouncements about the, the kid in the MAGA hat. And then I was just flat wrong and embarrassed and apologized for it. And so in these situations, I've just stopped trying to make moral pronouncements, you know, even if it's pretty much as clear as like the Rittenhouse thing where there's, you know, Harry off air for the patrons was like, well, we, you know, we don't know all the facts. I'm like, there was an interview with the kid before there's 900 angles of video on the Rittenhouse thing. There's a charge document now, like there's a lot of evidence, you know, but even then it's just sort of like, I, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm Blake and, and some of these other tragedies, it's just like sit back and watch and see what happens. And so, you know, the reality is there's a pattern of police shooting. It's like we always argue about step five, right? We want to we want to argue in a complex, complicated situation for our team. Like Blake is good, Blake is bad. Rittenhouse is good, Rittenhouse is bad. You know, instead of like just hanging back and kind of waiting and um, understanding that the cop has their own thought process. He has his thought process. Like mm -hmm. all that stuff is just a tragedy. And, and, you know, the small business owner that has his place torched is a tragedy. Rittenhouse is a tragedy. The people that he killed are, it's a tragedy. Like, and I'm just so exhausted by the constant need to force a binary good or bad or moral judgment on all these situations and tr focusing and dividing each other on, that moral pronouncement instead of uh, on that one incident and that moment of time on this one piece of video and is this or is this not and this and the, instead of like, 
All right. Well, what were the steps that lead to a 17 year old showing up feeling he needed to defend other people's property? Like what what goes into his decision making? What leads somebody like the people that he killed to show up to riot or to go and just hang out and be aggressive and yell in people's faces? What goes into, you know, a, a cop shooting a man seven times in the back in front of his three children. Like all this stuff is just like, this has been probably the toughest week since March or April for me, because like I, I hadn't really followed the Kenosha stuff and the Blake shooting because I was busy with other things. And then like the first time I paid attention was when I watched the video of Rittenhouse running around the car, shooting people and then, running back around, looking what he did and running off and then watching all the different videos and all the different angles. And I have to say that my first reaction to it was just incredible sadness for not only Rittenhouse, but also his victims. Like, and I know you're not supposed to feel sorry for Rittenhouse or you're not supposed to feel sorry for, you know, the people, the, the rioters or protesters or whichever they were there. I know you're not supposed to have positive emotions or emotions of uh, those complicated feelings about it because you're supposed to pick a team and argue it. But I talk to kids like Kyle Rittenhouse every single day on We Are Libertarian social media, especially on Instagram. And it's often very difficult and it's sometimes like talking to a brick wall. (laughs) And they're very indoctrinated with a certain strain of thinking and uh, very influenced by um, other meme pages. We talk, we talk, it's why we talk a lot about this stuff, you know, and why we try to warn people about their personal influence over others and the responsibility that each of us, like I have worked with audiences from dozens to millions over the course of 20 years. And I recognize the responsibility that I have because of this privilege of getting to speak to you as somewhat of an authority in your life. And I take that really seriously. So like, I don't want to, um, like I wouldn't, I oppose seatbelt laws, but I wouldn't tell you to go out and drive around without your seatbelt. Right? Like I, I oppose the government trying to attack smoking, but I wouldn't go out and tell you to start smoking because it's not, it's not healthy for you. The, the idea that we would encourage young men to go out with AR 15s or any kind of any, just to show up uh, to any of this shit is so dangerous to me. Like, and I just think that it's sort of a lust for violence that, that we're encouraging. And it's really a, a lot of the, the, the gun culture movement needs to examine like, where are you leading these kids? Because when you're 17, you do have some responsibility for yourself. You do have a cognitive adult brain somewhat, but you're also not sophisticated and not um, not seeing things in the way that the three of us see things because we're adult men. Um, and it's easy in this age and this day where everybody's so disconnected, especially young men, uh, there's a great book called Why Young Men about how gangs recruit young men and the psychology that plays into it of we know you're vulnerable, we know you're lonely, we know you're desperate for community, and we're going to give you a sense of meaning, and we want you to do these escalatory behaviors to prove that you're part of the club, and you know, it ends up putting those vulnerable, impressionable young men into jail. And you're starting to see that trend somewhat on both sides. I mean, it's not just the right. I mean, I'm consider myself more of the right. I see more of it. I'm, you know, former Republican. Most of my I'm in a red state like that's who I see more, which is probably why I react to some of this stuff more. Um, But I know if there's look at the ages of the people that died in Kenosha. They're all young. The people that, if you go, Nick Gillespie did an excellent interview that I highly recommend on Portland with a reporter who went out and talked to the people who were in Antifa and rioting in Portland. And what 
she found is that most of them are street kids. They're homeless teens, you know, that are finding a sense of meaning by being part of Antifa. You know, they're not there because they're ideological. They're there because they have nobody else in their life. They, she literally said that some of them tell her that the street kids, the homeless teens, are willing to stand on the front lines between the other protesters and police because nobody cares if they die. Like, I wanted to... Like, I mean, that is, uh, it's, uh, Indianapolis is this 12th largest city. We have 2,000 homeless teenagers in Indianapolis because there's no wraparound services. And so when protests spring up, they moved into the riots here in Indianapolis a few months ago. And you, know, you found time and time again in reporting and anecdotal evidence that a lot of these kids are homeless teens. They're they're definitely ideological people, but there's a lot of people involved in all of these sides who are young and vulnerable. And I personally am not going to use my voice to push anybody to go out and riot because make no mistake, Kyle Rittenhouse was a rioter. He was just your type of rioter, which is why you're okay with it. Um, I think it's an absolute tragedy that this man, this this kid went out and, and and there's rumors that his mom drove him, you know, just, and he's not like a libertarian kid. He was in the front row of a, a Trump rally and back the blue all the way. You know, I mean, it's, 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 um, it just, I don't know. Am I wrong for having sympathy, I guess, for these two sides and also just disgust for the environment that leads up to it? Like the voter Picks the politician that promises all kinds of action and, and government force. Then the police have to go in and, and enforce those laws, which increases the interaction they have with the public. And then more people get killed because of those violent interactions. Then there's outrage, rightful outrage over deaths by at the hands of the state. And then people come out and show their rage, which enrages other people who then go out. And the violence is just tit for tatting its way to someplace very dangerous. And like encouraging that is not something I'm going to lend my voice to because libertarianism is ultimately about nonviolence, Reinhold. Yeah. And it, and the worst part is that on top of all of that, then you have people trying to politicize the whole thing, right? So right. you have people who are trying to gain votes and to garner power by pitting these people who, who do have these conflicting thought processes and, and, desires and experiences in life and uh, pitting them against each other and making them feel like they're only res the, re the only resort they have is violence. Right. I mean, how long, you know, we talk about the, these protests shouldn't turn into to violent riots and, and they shouldn't. But the problem is, is that they're arguing about things that they're complaining about things that have been a problem for decades. And I hear comments like, well, what, they should just stop writing and then we can sit down and have the conversation and try and work that out. They've been doing that for decades. They're not getting anybody to listen to them. They're not getting anybody to care about their position, at least nobody in power, in order to do something about it. So they feel like they have to amp it up and try to get attention, to try to, to make a point, to, to I, be I don't, heard. I don't – I'm going to – we're going to flesh out the riot stuff a little bit more and talk about it, but I don't buy that. I don't buy that every single person that is destroying property is no, ideologically motivated. I, I don't ag I agree with you completely. I, there a lot, are a lot of them of are breaking are into Best Buy. Yeah, they're oh, breaking yeah. into Best Buys to sell things on oh, Facebook Marketplace. Oh like, yeah, most of the most of the people who are doing the looting are doing that. I think there are people who like like the people who are tagging the the uh, the federal buildings in in Portland. Right, they weren't doing that to try and get money or opportunism they were trying to make a point but then the people going into the best buy or breaking into some other store and trying to to run out with a bunch of goods those people are just opportunists right those those are people who you know but they're not they're not the movement they're not the people who are doing who are trying to get the attention is what i'm trying to say so i hate when we try to say all of the people protesting are terrorists or all of the people who are trying to defend property are, are horrible people too. You know, it's like you have good people on both sides. And, and I know oh, I just oh, said something oh, that dang. Trump said, wow. I know I did it. I know I did. And Trump, but Trump gets, I, 
I have Reinhold derangement I, syndrome now. I completely don't like the what happened there with, with what Trump said, but I also will defend that Trump wasn't trying to say that the the racists were good people. I mean, the, the left's trying to make it sound like he is. He said that, but that's not what he was trying to say. If you read what he was saying, he was trying right. to say that, you know, there are people who are just upset about this and there are people who are right. upset about it on both sides. And, and those people should not be discounted because you've got bad actors on both sides who are doing that sort of thing. So uh, you're going to hear me defend Trump. No, and you should, because that yeah. that particular statement about Charlottesville has been completely mm -hmm. taken out of context and used against Trump in an unfair way because he was trying to be nuanced. He's just he's never nuanced. He he's, has well, he's, and he's not really good at it. Yeah. Um, now, Harry, you're a gun owner. Um, mm -hmm. I am not. I don't it, like I want people who don't. Un are you Reinhold? Yeah, if you I, want have, I have several guns. I live in the country. I have to have guns. You know? yeah. um, let me let me uh, just say that. that if you are not familiar with gun culture, 99.999% of people who own guns do not act like a 17 year old in the 17 year old in Kenosha, Washington or, or Kenosha, Wisconsin. I guarantee that that made every gun owner think more about gun safety. You guys tell me if I'm wrong, but I want people to understand that when people try to use something like this to push gun control, they're absolutely wrong and they don't understand what I have learned over 15 years because I, when I was hired by the Libertarian Party, I didn't tell anybody this, but I was just like, I don't get why you'd want a gun. I don't understand it. I didn't understand it at all. you know. And then over 15 years, I watched the um, unbelievable care and concern and respect and responsibility uh, that gun owners take in, in owning a firearm. And this is not representative of gun owners. And anybody that tries to make it so is just being manipulative and wrong. Um, but, you know, there's stories, about, there's stories about the Kenosha thing where the the other guys who are there who are who are more organized, you know, boog guys mm -hmm. um, looking for the boogaloo guys. They encountered Kyle and were trying to distance themselves from him because they felt something was off about him. Really? Right? They. Mm -hmm there are a lot of them who just like he was he was acting a little sketchy or whatever we just we should act and no one else did i mean all those people with guns there and then you know no one else seemed to have the felt the need to to engage in the actions he engaged in right it was right it wasn't like he was a lone guy by himself with a gun and then happened to get himself into a bad situation so much as it was there was a whole bunch of people there but they weren't going to use deadly force or raise their guns or do any of that stuff unless it was very clear danger they probably you know uh, i think it's the kenosha i think they had a name the kenosha militia or the kenosha guard or they had some name and there was some level of organization amongst the people who were there that night correct and they were there for in my mind, noble causes. They they want to protect small business owners. They want to protect the livelihoods of people because the 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 and we're gonna talk about law and order in just a moment, but the city, the the state has completely failed in protecting most of the that's where most of the blame lays. Like I I, I don't know if this has been verified, but the mayor of Kenosha asked for 700 guard the night of the shooting, and he only allowed 250 begrudgingly. And the and the governor is basically a weak governor and is is uh, basically these. Here's how you know politicians are all spineless weasels. Okay, the Republicans don't really have any idea of where their base is because they're so beat up by polls from 2016 and Donald Trump and not trusting polls that they really just kind of go along. They make the calculation that it's safer to go along with Donald Trump because he's president, and you know if the majority of their base is MAGA, then they're going to be fine. You know, but if anybody steps out and they've seen a couple social signals in Mark Sanford and Justin Amash that stepping out will get you killed in politically. Democrats are the same way. They don't know where their base is at. And so these Democratic mayors and Democratic governors don't really know where their base is at on things like BLM. They see the polling where, you know, the majority of people in this country support the general notion of black lives matter that black lives matter that black people are equal 
and deserve to be treated with dignity and respect and that the boot should be taken off of their neck and criminal justice reform should be enacted. Most people agree with that, yep. you know, and so it, it, and they don't want to alienate those independent and democratic base by coming out because these th that general notion and BLM have been so associated with the rioters and it and it and it's different and so they don't want to come out and and be seen as doing anything that is pro police or pro law and order when the state has taken the monopoly of security and and said we'll we'll be responsible for this you can be responsible for your own home but even if you draw a gun in self defense in your own home we're probably going to put you in jail you know and so we're going to take care of your safety we guarantee it and then these liberal cities have completely failed and broken down and it is not an irrational thought that if property is not going to be protected by the state then the citizens need to protect their own community um it, it definitely is i mean do you, what do you think harry and that's, what, and that's what you're seeing with like a lot of the militia uh, the militias going out there and protecting their own streets um that's what is going on is especially in a lot of the different neighborhoods in oregon uh when they because a lot of them like it's like well they're just protesting at the courthouse downtown no they are going to residential neighborhoods waking people up at all hours of the, in, of the night making sure you know you can't sleep you know no justice no sleep um so people are you know they're getting upset and they're wanting to protect themselves and we're watching also some of these bad actors in state control use the power of the state just to protect themselves uh we see this with um Ch the chicago mayor using the police to protect make sure there's no protesting happening near her house so it's, well, minneapolis granted themselves security guards with right. guns mm -hmm. while they're tr talking about abolishing the police department correct yes. you know, the, the hypocrisy. <laughs> that's why i always go why are, why are why is the right so terrified of the far left because once people see these people they start to turn against them. I had a conversation with Miss Pat and Dion, and mm -hmm. and it'll come out this Tuesday. And and they're just like, why are why is a crowd of white people screaming in a white woman's face about racism? Why the the moment of progress, you know, has and I'm not going to put words in their mouth, but this was my interpretation. Like we could have had more, and we're arguing about riots like what the what the fuck are you guys doing you're not helping yeah it's long been known like it's easier like a leaderless movement it's hard to stop it yeah. grows really quickly and it's an and it's, sometimes it's an amazing on what it can do the other problem is you muddy the message the message gets muddy so one problem like so like bml movement bml organization you know they was like well it kept trying to separate themselves which caused confusion right and then anyone they anyone realized they could just call themselves blm because the BML organization separates them from the BML movement, so anyone can call them that. So all their messages got muddied. So all so any person in the MAGA crowd could easily find a news article or a uh, audio clip of someone of someone is like, "I'm with BLM and we support these looting. They need to take this is reparations." And like, and use this as a cudgel, like, "Oh yeah, this is why they're all bad," and just 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 get rid of all all the boot every momentum that BLM had, you know, from the George Floyd uh, protest. It's, it, it's disgusting. You know, they you know, I don't want to tell people what they should do is, but they should have went like distant themselves. Like, nope, it's organization or it's, this, I, I hate trying to tell them to do a top down thing, but Hey, if someone's using your name and trying to take out your movement, sometimes you need to step up and separate themselves from that. You well, know? that's, and that's why I think you're starting like Joe Biden put out a video denouncing riots like you're going to start seeing and and it really a lot of this falls squarely on these politicians that like here in Indianapolis, the, the, the police department is. They feel that they've been completely abandoned by the mayor. Yes. Um, and so we had an incident where uh, Deshaun Reed was shot and killed by police. He had a gun and uh you know, BLM has really gone to bat for him, but not many, not many other people are willing to because of the the way that the shooting happened. You know, and and uh, but the mayor wants to to please that constituency because he's a Democrat, but at the same time, the the police have have are are, are almost ready to stage walkouts. So there's this very complicated issue of, you know, it it, it all kind of falls um, under. 
how we interact with the law and where we're at in terms of the size of the state. And so this is the conversation that I, instead of arguing over um, was this self-defense or not, was this a good shooting or not, was this, were the cops justified or not? Like that to me is sort of not helpful uses of energy. Right. Like we're arguing again over step five when we should start at step one and start thinking about our relationship to the state and our relationship to how the government functions. And even in a completely anarcho capitalist, anarcho communist state, there is still law enforcement. There's still justice like it's not Somalia. And I think part of the, the libertarian conservative reaction to canonizing Kyle Rittenhouse signals to people that don't understand anything about guns that you really do want Somalia. And I think it, it's very kind of, it's a harmful argument. And we, we often say, Oh, the gun debate is settled, but like everybody kind of thought after George Floyd, police reform was settled. Like it's going to happen. But then they lost the moment with the riots. They lost the argument. And now that is not really on the table, which is, incredibly frustrating to black people and is going to start bubbling up you you're not seeing the frustration with the white liberal the white woke person yet but you will and that's why i just think it's like by turning off the people that are natural allies you know which is kind of like uh clinton is arguing here i'm sick of seeing pics of spike Cohn posing in pics with blm when their stated platform sounds like the 10 planks of the communist manifesto and their methods of protest are antithetical to the LP non-initiation of force principle. Seeing a few porcupine shirts among the chaos made me hang my head in shame. Probably hired crisis actors or hired, hired muscle meant to defame us, at least I hope. I couldn't agree or disagree with you more. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter is a grassroots, bottom-up organization like the Tea Party. Matt Kibbe was greatly associated with the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean that Matt Kibbe was in charge and Freedom Works were in charge of the Tea Party at that time. There were hundreds of Tea Party groups around the country with their own different motivations. Just like there are a ton of different libertarians with their own different motivations. Mm -hmm. And w there are a lot of libertarians like Spike Cohn who look at Black Lives Matter and go, I don't agree with you on these four pieces, but I agree with you on these three pieces. And this is how we can advance liberty by being allies with these people. I always just kind of shake my head and, and like, there's going to be a lot of libertarians who are going to vote for Donald Trump. And they're going to loudly say they're voting for Donald Trump. And they're not going to suffer any penalty whatsoever. It's not disqualifying in any way. But if they were to come out and say they're voting for Joe Biden, they'd never live it down. We, we still, Bill Weld and Hillary Clinton never lived down. But there are plenty of libertarians who said that, you know, like Walter Block saying, you should vote in, in your interest and vote for Donald Trump. Well, you're willing to ally with the right. And there's a lot of people who are willing to get cozy to very grotesque people on the right because you've made the calculation that that helps advance liberty, but you're uncomfortable when somebody does it with the left. And I don't understand that. I'm willing to work with anybody that's willing to, to help achieve liberty. Like the Republicans and Democrat brands and messages are largely rejected. You know, there were like 60 million people who voted for Clinton, 60 million people that voted for Trump. There's, and then there's like 110 million people that just didn't vote because they don't feel there's any representation. There's a huge gap in the middle of people that don't feel like they're represented. And the wasted vote is completely ob obliterated by exit polling every single election year. And when you go and break down like Lucy Brenton in Indianapolis uh, and in Indiana for Senate or the Georgia Senate race in 2018, you see an exit polling an enormous demographic difference, 1% in uh, above 40, 10% below 40 voting for libertarians. And then you also have an enormous demo, like we don't pull from Republicans and Democrats. Like in Georgia, the libertarian candidate polled like 1% from, oh, it was the governor's rates, excuse me, 1% from Kemp, 2% from, um, what's the lady that thinks she won? 
Uh, <laughs> I forget her name. Yeah. And then the like 96% of the rest of the vote for the libertarian candidate were from independents or non voters or reactivated voters. Mm -hmm. And so they finally see somebody that represents their viewpoint. So copying the message of a Republican or Democrat wholesale is a losing strategy and turns off our natural allies in the middle in the center that are willing and the non-crazy fringe like the non-crazy middle like pandering to the far right and the far left is just a losing strategy harry what were you gonna say yeah yeah i was just gonna echo what you've posted online which is yeah it's the these are two dying parties why will we copy their message why would we follow their exact same dying path you know, that's goofy. You want to grow, you want to become, you know, the center stage mainstream, you have to do something different. Yeah, you know, I absolutely. Know. I, I like rotary motors, so, yeah. I, I can't tell different. who this is, so it's just a Facebook user. Who's signaling they want Somalia? It's not that you're signaling that you want Somalia because you want Somalia. It's that you don't understand how you look and you don't give a shit because you're not willing to talk to people that don't think and look like you. So I apologize if that's my best friend in the entire world, but that's how it comes across to people that aren't exactly like you. <laughs> For God's sake, stop reading the Daily Caller and go meet some people that aren't like you. Like that is, it's just, when you try to explain how you come across to other people, there's a, a large swath of people who don't take that well and just go, I don't care what you want, I'm going to do what I want. And it's, it's like, okay, you're just, it's so frustrating. Um, but so, may, go ahead. Go to where, like, he also posted was talking about uh, some people are like reject your principles at your core. And it's just like, yeah, but a lot of people in the middle will reject certain principles, but they'll allow you to have those. You know, I'm, you know, it is, it's uh, when we have our walnut meetings or Liberty Chill on Fridays, we've got, you know, hard socialists that will come to our meeting, you know, card carrying socialists and they understand and, you know, but he's such a middle centrist. The, the, the idea that to him, socialism has to be voluntary now, you know, it's great to watch that change and just having conversations of having, talking to someone who look completely different than I do, have completely different views and we've met in the middle and, it, and it's great. It's, a, it's an amazing time. Yeah, this person says, what if the non-crazy middle fundamentally rejects your core principles? Then they do. Like, they're, they're, they, like you're not going to please everyone. This part of society, it doesn't matter if it's a free society, the society we live in, or a, a socialist system. Like, you're not going to please everybody. Just be yourself. Be honest. Say exactly what you think. And people will then either be with you or they won't be with you, right? Like, that's that's sort of where the radicals have been right in, in opposition to the Gary Johnson, Bob Barr campaigns. Like, just say what you really think instead of trying to lie to people. I, I really get that, like, this, we need to appeal to the far right or we need to appeal to the far left or we need to appeal, like, you, you're basically arguing that we need to lie to people. That's some, When I hear people say Joe's messaging is this or that, I go... So you're asking her to lie to the voter to make you feel better. That's not, what, believe, what? That's not what Ron Paul did. If we believe in our ideas and our, our ideas are the more superior idea and view and philosophy, then why would we want to couch that in some way to try to trick people into liking or, or agreeing with us? It should win just in the, in the marketplace of ideas. We should be able to make the point overwhelmingly show the evidence right mm -hmm. and and not have to try to gain the system in order to get people to vote for us who don't necessarily agree with us on all things or, or whatever i mean just just put it out there and if people will listen to it and agree with it or they won't agree with it or they'll argue with you and you just you discuss it and you come up with you know some sort of proof of your of your thought processes by going like i've always said if you do we do out and prove that this works which we can do we prove that libertarianism can work because we just ignore what the government's doing and do our own thing anyway and we'll make it work and people can point to that and say see it's working then you can convince people but you know that's i don't i don't get the we, we can't talk that we should go and talk to it like joe is on ben shapiro's program right and had a conversation there. Well, and, and, and the left libertarians were, lost their fucking mind yeah, that Joe Jorgensen won the largest radio show in America, second, like after, 
after Rush Limbaugh. And I'm just like, what are we doing? Like, I'm not here to grow your club. I'm not doing this to, to grow your club. I'm doing this so more people hear the libertarian ideology because it's incredibly freeing. Like, I'm not here to grow one faction of a movement. I'm here to grow the entire movement. Like, and I, I just, it gets so frustrating. Um, you, can, you get the message out and, you know, go go where the people will listen. And, and I, the spike is reaching out to people who I feel that, so I feel a lot of times people on the left are more aligned with libertarians except for they for two things one is they don't understand the um hold on a second how dare you i know it's not i can't do anything about that one but they uh they don't understand that um government is for so they, they try to have a, a a government solution for something they're not clicking in their head that they're just asking for people to point a gun at their neighbor and make this happen. They just think that they're voting for a, a, a system where we agree that this is what we should do. And therefore it's written in stone that this is what we should do. Therefore everybody will just do it. They're, they're not making that leap to this is force. And then there are people who are saying that they're Marxists, but they're not really Marxists. They're just anti-crony capitalism. Well, guess what? I'm anti-crony capitalism. Most libertarians are anti-crony capitalism. So that's not a free market, right? So we want free market capitalism, which does not exist at the moment. So we're fighting against the current economic system that we have. Well, so are they. And I think that they just, if they if they knew that there was an actual difference and they thought through it and we, we were able to explain that to them, then they would become libertarians about that. that and that's happening. Lost causes. Yeah, and that's exactly right. They're, that's happened on the right with foreign policy. You know, there were there's a lot of discomfort for libertarians over the last 20 years trying to appeal to conservatives to be non-interventionists, despite immense pressure from the party structure not to agree with it. But Ron Paul, Rand Paul, libertarians in general are starting to succeed on that. And, you know, Donald Trump, that's one of the the good things that we're going to talk about, and it, it's complicated. It's not good or bad. Um, but, you know, that that's where I don't get it. It's like, if you go and talk, to, if Spike goes and talks to Black Lives Matter, and you share the goal of everybody having more prosperity and economic opportunity, you just have different solutions. Why not persuade them that you're, we are right. Like, there is, like, using force of any kind in any way backfires it creates resentment and creates the opposite of what you're trying to achieve and if you make that argument enough to both of these sides eventually they're going to see your point because history is moving that way mm -hmm. i've never had more people on the left and the right come to me than i have this year going i see what you mean about the utilitarian breakdown like it doesn't work. Government doesn't work. Force doesn't work. Now what's the solution? Right. I, I'm, I'm willing to lay down my uh, sense of the Democrats can fix this or the Republicans can fix this. What do we do now? Mm -hmm. You know, and so I, I think appealing to messaging that creates defectors from the other two sides and re reinforces the worst messaging of the two sides is uh, not going to work. So I, I want to move on to just the idea of law and order um, because I think this is an important part of it. Obviously, it is illegal, immoral, and wrong without any qualification for someone to destroy someone else's property. There's no but after this. I want to be very clear about that just because I, I have a different opinion on certain things than some other people. It doesn't mean that I'm not for property rights and li libertarians that have some nuance are getting really fucking sick and tired of you trying to project your bias onto uh, onto those of us who are not in your club. Um, there's, it's an unequivocal evil to go into someone's property and just burn it down because it, it just is like there's there's no way around it. And so that's lawlessness. And that is what the right is saying we're against. We want law and order. We want the law upheld. But then when somebody doesn't follow the law but is on their side, they're not condemning that either. 
but also as libertarians, there's a lot of things, including about around guns, that we find to be immoral laws. So there's a lot of things, and I'm, I'm not, I'm going to play this clip because of A, to give you information, but B, to kind of, as a thinking exercise, uh, we often go, this is how the world should work. I want it to work this way, instead of realizing that this is how the world actually works, and we have to somewhat reconcile our viewpoint of as few or no laws versus where we're at now. So this is from the Advisory Opinions podcast, which is David French and Sarah Isger of The Dispatch, which is really the only conservative site that I even look at anymore. <laughs> um, so uh, David French is a lawyer, Sarah Isger is a lawyer, and they're kind of breaking down written houses legal issues and and some of the, the the factors that play in here and then we'll talk about it on the other side one of them is that you may not be as a matter of law entitled to use force to defend the property that you're defending so that'll be a um, problem yeah so let me read to you the relevant wisconsin statute a person is privileged to defend a third person's property from real or apparent unlawful interference by, an un by another under the same conditions and by the same means as those under by which the person is privileged to defend his or own property from real, real or un apparent unlawful interference, provided, always read after provided, that the person unreasonably believes the facts are such as would give the third person to privilege to defend his or her own, own property that his or her intervention is necessary for the protection of the third person's property and the third person whose property the person is protecting is a member of his or her immediate family or household or a person whose property the person has a legal duty to protect or is a merchant and the actor is the merchant's employee or agent. And this is an odd additional sentence. An official or adult employee or agent of a library is privileged to defend the property of the library in the manner sub specified in this subsection. I guess there must okay, have been Okay, well, that answer. has a story behind it, but we'll <laughs> that does, skip that over that. So in other words, it has to be your family's property, your household's property, um, a property you have a legal duty to protect, or you like have to be instance, an employee. Like, for instance, if you're a security guard or, uh, yeah, you've entered into some contractual relationship there. Yep, or you have to be a merchant, uh, and, uh, an employee or agent of the merchant. So if I'm showing up with my AR to the local uh, 7-Eleven to defend it, I don't have the right to do that. Yeah, there could be some questions. Uh, for instance, if you show up to a business, the business owner is there also trying to defend his property. Can he create an agent relationship in the moment with you? Maybe. Uh, Maybe. But if the business owner isn't there and you just are like, uh, you know, pew, pew, I'm here to defend random property that I don't know about. Uh, that is certainly not covered by what you're talking about. And it looked like that was what was going on in Kenosha last night, not referring even specifically to the video that we're going to talk about, but just in general, that some people thought that they were deputized to just go protect property, generally speaking, in downtown Kenosha. I also want to say, um, break in here, that the Kenosha Guard asked the Sheriff's Department to deputize them so they could act as agents of the state to help them protect property. And the Sheriff of the county said, absolutely not. So they they were denied that request. And, and also, here's another relevant Wisconsin statute. It is not reasonable to intentionally use force intended or likely to cause death or great bodily harm for the sole purpose of defense of one's property. So, um, it, so that was true that, in every state I'm aware of, you cannot use deadly force. It basically, it's like rock, paper, scissors and life always trumps property. Right. Right. Now there are some states where you don't have, you have the stand, the stand your ground, you have stand your ground status is the instant you set foot on, someone sets foot on your property of you zero duty to retreat. Um, that's, you know, Missouri, for example, where we had the McCloskey situation. But so here you have, you do not, it is not reasonable to use deadly force to defend property. And if you're a third party and you're not the employer agent of the merchant, you don't have the right to defend their property. 
And then let's throw the other complicator here on there, which is that it's actually also a crime to point your weapon at somebody. Okay. So but David, if, we have all of those things that apply before that video starts, essentially. Yes. So yes. you're walking around downtown Kenosha with a gun, quote unquote, defending property. You can be charged with a number of crimes based on what you're reading, David. You're criming. You're if criming. You, if you're sitting there outside of a 7-Eleven and you point an AR at somebody to defend the 7-Eleven that is not yours and, and you've not been deputized to defend it, you have committed a crime. Flat out, you've committed a crime. Um. Now, at the same time, uh, so I, I also have a right to defend myself. <laughs> right. And that's where we get into the video that we watched and the controversy around it. Yes. So in the video we watched, a young man is running. He's got a, a rifle. And he's running with his rifle through protesters. He apparently trips and falls and people yell, get him. At which point, a, uh, two or three guys kind of cluster around him. The guy who falls opens fire, everyone scatters, one person falls, another person staggers away injured, and then you hear other gunshots. So now here, here's where this gets so tangled. So if he's pointed his weapon at people unlawfully, the people he points at suddenly have a right of self-defense themselves. Okay, this is how this gets so tangled. Um, remember the Al Ahmad Arbery shooting? Yep. Um, a lot of people said, well, Arbery was attacking the person who, who had blocked his way. Well, as soon as, you know, when they blocked his way, when those gentlemen blocked his way, and I use that term loosely, uh, when those guys blocked his way and pointed a weapon at him, Arbery had a right to defend himself. So this gets really, really complicated. And it's like reasons one through 1,000 why you don't, strap on a weapon and go head towards the riot. Yeah. You just don't do that. Um, but, you know, it's funny. I, I'm seeing a little bit on sort of this right-wing Twitter world, Sarah. I'm seeing people, you know, how the right piles on the left that when the left won't condemn Antifa. Why aren't you condemning Antifa? I'm not seeing much condemnation of the vigilantes. And two people are dead who did not need to be. Exactly. Um, now, here's what I'd say about that. Uh, how do you restore law and order by breaking the law? <laughs> and then how, how do you deal with laws that you personally find immoral or disagreeable? You know, the, um, let me go here. Uh, Clinton rightly, and I agree with, says, boo, the castle doctrine or stand your ground is okay by me. Well, there's a process in our system, in the day and age in which we live, of changing laws or dealing with law enforcement problems and it's a legislature it's a legislative process it's what we said basically about the confederate statues the purpose of a constitutional republic is that you don't go and tear down a confederate statue because you want that statue down you you have to go through a process where everybody gets a say or else it builds resentment and backlash Right. And so you're going to see resentment and backlash when people take the law into their own hands, regardless of the side, instead of dealing with it. In, and to me, that's a that's a road towards barbarism. You know, there's the road to serfdom, but there's also a road to barbarism. And it seems like both sides are trying to take us there by completely throwing out the process that created the country in which we live that offered up all this economic opportunity that offered up a system that allowed America to, to go from uh, a very flawed country in its founding to uh, a greater chance of opportunity because that democratic Republic, that re constitutional Republic allows for everybody to have a voice in the system. Okay. So that's my argument for constitutionalism. Now, Let's say it's an anarcho-capitalist society. There's still, you will still have courts and private police forces. You will voluntarily opt into those. And so do you want to live in a 
a locality where everyone lives voluntarily and someone just doesn't follow the laws. Now, that's going to happen, which is why there will be adjudication in an anarcho-capitalist society. But laws and rules that are agreed upon by the group upon voluntary consent is the best way to organize things, right? Because yeah. if you're forcing law on me, then I'm going to resent you for it. If you're making me wear a mask, I'm mad about it. If I volunteer to wear a mask because you've persuaded me to wear a mask, I'm, I'm less likely to reject that notion because I've been a part of the decision-making process. And so to advocate that people should just do whatever they want in defense of property rights is a very sloppy way to run a society, be it the one we're in now or the one we're trying to work towards, because it encourages people to just not follow the rules that are agreed upon in, in different societies, right? So there, the, um, the, the other part of this, uh, and I lost my train of thought, so Harry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so it's, it also helps stop vigilantism because the idea that, you know, without some of those rules that have been officially deputized is because the, the communities around that area has decided that we're going to have a police force and this police force is going to be the, uh, the enforcer of the laws of the state. If without certain rules like that to stopping people from doing that, then you've got people putting on bat capes and walking around with their guns and they're playing and they're you know watching way too many saturday morning cartoon shows or die hard movies and wanting to go out there and protect the public which i get it i freaking get it you know uh when you're watching your uh just when you're watching all this happening you just kind of you know you want to do something but you know there there are rules in place and uh, unless someone's life is you know being you know taken you know sometimes you just got to stand back it's what do you think, Randall? Is it am I wrong? Well, I mean, so the question is, is what's the answer there? And and I don't know, you know, what you do in that point, right? So that's that's part of the problem is you know, we're talking about a society. Let's say we're in a we're in an anarcho anarcho capitalist society, and there's th this idea of people. You're going to have somebody who tries to take over the the it, who wants more. Who wants somebody else's stuff? That's why we have theft now. I mean, we mm -hmm. there's somebody who's going to try to do that, and there's got to be a mechanism in place to stop that from happening. And when you agree upon that mechanism, you're agreeing upon basically a, a system of government, right? And we're not going to call it government; it's going to be an, a voluntary anarcho-capitalist system. But you still have to have rules in place in order for there to be a functional society, so that people can operate with each other in some sort of method that they're not having to strap and be carrying uh, every second of every day in order to defend themselves from all the people who want to try and stop them. And, and they're mm -hmm. going to get overwhelmed by a mob. And then, then what do you do then? So it's, it's better to come together and communicate and, and come up with solutions on how we think things should go um, and try to follow that as opposed to uh, trying to force people to do because that's the problem with human nature and it's so there's a lot of these different philosophies that just ignore human nature so, uh, socialism is one of them right communism but sometimes i wonder about libertarianism too because they try to pretend like if we don't if we just let everybody be they're all going to make the right decision and we see that that's not the case we know that that's not the case certain people are going to try to game the system or take advantage of other people Right. If you have private police force and and you have them um, policing things like that, there's nothing to stop them from, you know, being uh, bought out by rich business interests. Right. That that'll happen. Uh, I mean, you can go back and look at the um, um, the private police force in the 1800s. And I can't remember for some reason, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, the Pinkertons. Right. So the Pinkertons were. Um, a private police force, but they ended up working for businesses and not caring about individual rights and going out and doing some things that were really bad. Um, so it's, it, it becomes, it's hard to say that it's got to be all this way or all that way. People have to come together and come to an agreement on some of this stuff. Right. And we have to, we have to accept that. Yeah. Um, 
And the other part, and I'm and genuinely asking a question here, and I wonder if somebody could write write in on this because uh, so we can talk about it next week. You know, in terms of property rights, is it a violation of property rights if you're defending property that the property owner doesn't want you to defend? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so if let's say you know I'm guarding a CVS and the CVS does not want me on their property, is that a violation? But the mentality is I'm there to protect their property. So I have the moral good, but you haven't cooperated with that property owner. So I wonder if somebody could write in and, and give me a thought on that. And I would just say, as she said in there in law, tr life trumps property. Um, how many lives is a CBS worth? So, I mean, I just look at this and I, Ryan Lindsay is very much more on the left. Doesn't really cut into property rights much. And, and that's where he kind of goes, how many people is worth, how many lives is CVS worth? And I thought that was an interesting question to ask yourself, just to kind of go through um, some of the comments here. Uh, Wes says, if you have rules, you have to have enforcement and consequences or they're invalid. You're absolutely right. And in a libertarian society, uh, there is enforcement of the rules. So that, that does exist. It's just that you don't have a monopoly on violence. You don't have a monopoly on the police force. So if the police force is doing things that you find to be egregious, you can hire another police force and the perpetrators of the violation of the rights that have been pre-established, they will suffer consequences. And there's no qualified immunity in a libertarian society because you're right. Consequences and incentives are at the root of everything. Aggression is a violation of natural law, writes Christopher Bowen. Brown, excuse me. Neoconservatives and neoliberals have advocated for it so long that it has become accepted practice in the minds of people. Just because it is accepted does not make it right. And you're right. When adults look to violence as the solution for every problem, how can we be shocked that a 17-year-old sees violence as the appropriate tool to fight other people who see violence as an effective tool? Um, so uh, let's see. Clinton says, agree, libertarianism's notion is that people are basically good and trustworthy, clashes with my worldview as a Christian minister, but more important to this discussion, it just isn't honest. Um, I don't agree with that. Uh, I don't think that libertarianism makes the assumption that every person is good. Uh, this There's a foundational book that everybody ought to read. It's called Conflict of Visions by Thomas Sowell, where he talks about constrained and unconstrained. There is a certain view in the world that government can perfect man and that if we have just the right technical policies, you can make people, you can nudge them into being uh, well-behaving people. And I don't believe that. I'm a libertarian because I'm a Christian too who believes that we're all fallen. Every person is imperfect. Every person is complicated and isn't good or bad. They're just difficult. I just watched The Green Book, amazing movie, loved it. And one of the characters is found out to be gay and another character looks at him and goes i was a bouncer in new york city in uh, nightclubs i know the world's a complicated place and doesn't make that one of either you know that's sort of the reaction that we all ought to have to everyone and so what libertarianism does is it says everybody is imperfect so let's create a solution that works with that imperfectness where everybody gets a voice, everybody gets to agree, and we stop forcing people into decisions that they had no uh, a say in because we want to lessen resentment. And the less violent solutions, like you see in this whole chain of events, it's violence begets violence begets violence begets violence. And then so we're arguing step five in the begetting of violence. And so um, if we go back and work our way back, there's, there's going to be murder. And there's going to be chaos and there's going to be rioting in libertarian societies. There will just be less of it because there's more prosperity and more economic opportunity and people have more of a say in the rules. It doesn't it's not a utopian society that perfects man and erases their warts. It designs systems that better accommodate that fallen nature. And that's, um, that's the thing that I want to touch on, too, when you're talking about better prosperity for Pete, for everybody. If you look at what's going on now and then you graph out what's been happening with the wealth in this country, 
where the top 5% are getting wealthier and wealthier and everybody else is kind of middling around and, and having to fight harder to even, even the middle class is fighting harder to kind of keep things going and, and make do you start, to, that's where all these frustrations and things start bubbling up. That's yep. the problem with the crony capitalist system we have is that we're not allowing that real free market to, to uh, cover those the separations and in, in wealth that it, it doesn't, it, doesn't work there those people are being protected by the political elites uh to continue making more money get those money in this get that money in the stock market it's pop the stock market up that's not the economy the stock market is not the economy and when you start seeing that um that huge disparity start to pop up that's when you start seeing the frustrations really start building